Welcome to CXO Talk, episode 822. We're exploring strategies around AI investment at CBRE, the largest commercial real estate services company in the world. Our guest is Satnam Singh, the company's chief digital and technology officer. Tell us about CBRE and tell us about your role. We've got about 115,000 employees um, in about more than 500 offices in more than 100 countries here. We serve, you know, 95% of the Fortune 100. My role, Michael, is uh, is twofold. I serve as the Chief Digital and Technology Officer for the Advisory Services part of the uh, CBRE, where uh, my team and I we focus on digital and data strategies, applications, and solutions uh, across uh, brokerage sales and financing, property management, and the appraisal businesses. Uh, I also lead the digital and tech for our marketing organization across all uh, segments of CBRE. Can you give us context about real estate and real estate services so that we can understand your your strategy with, within that? At CBRE, we really look at the entire real estate life cycle, right? So we look at all the way from asset identification, you know, investment decisions, property management. We look at operational workflows, you know, how we can introduce AI uh, within those operational workflows to serve our clients better. Um, we look at predictive analytics, as I talked about, you know, especially as you look at all the data that we collect, we collect about 39 billion data points across 300 different data sources. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity, if you will, across the real estate life cycle where the amount of data that we have, uh, we can really bring a lot of uh, uh, both analytics as well as AI to bear, if you will. So the data aspect of it is uh, is very foundational. Absolutely. We have, for example, I'll give you our smart facility management solutions, right? We have about 1 billion square foot of uh, across 20,000 global workspace solution clients that we have. We have building operations and utilization data, highly integrated data, right? That uh, that we uh, utilize through AI, and using that, you know, we start looking at actions such as automated maintenance, uh, if you will. Uh, similarly, on the unstructured side, we have data through a lot of documents, right? I mean, there's a lot of documents in commercial real estate, right? Whether that be a lease document, rent roll, uh, pitch decks, if you will. So we have, you know, a large foundation of both structured and unstructured data. How does that data then feed into the underlying strategy that you have for AI? One is how do we really think about AI at CBRE? So if you think about the digital AI roadmap, how do we align that with strategic business priorities, right? How do we think about the client outcomes? What are our focus areas? What are the market dynamics, uh, if you will, that are important for us, right? So that's the strategic business alignment. The second is, how do we get faster time to value, right? What data do we have, data that we can use or data that we can source through our partnerships, if you will. In addition, what capabilities do we have? What capabilities can we develop as well as acquire, um, again, through partnerships or otherwise? And then how do we operationalize faster versus the competition, right? So that's the second pillar of faster time to value with it's part of the digital AI roadmap. The third thing is scale. Michael, the size of the problem and the universality, if you will, of the problem. Size means, you know, it's easier to solve things at the scale of one property or one lease, if you will, right? But when you really start thinking about building platforms, if you will, for multi-segment solutions or operating at portfolio scale of buildings, you got to think about this differently. And again, at CBRE, we think about the data platform and this AI. We take a very balanced and pragmatic approach, right? As I talked about that strategic alignment, uh, we really have practical AI use cases that we work on with the business teams. Our approach isn't AI for the sake of AI or innovation for the sake of innovation, right? It's about really utilizing AI and technology in practical situations, right? And that's where we look at, okay, what is the opportunity for automation or the operating, you know, operational workflows, if you will, and then, as I said, right, on the scale side, again, going back to the data platform, having 39 billion data points across 300 sources really uh, is a huge benefit for us. We're describing briefly the use cases. Mm -hmm. So you're, 
use cases then are aligned to specific business goals or specific outcomes that are important strategically for CBRE. I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, that that's what's going on. In real estate, um, you have three things, right? You have transactions, right? With a lot of transactions. Um, You have assets, which require maintenance. And you have assets that are, in essence, investments, right? So when you think about these transactions, right, um, they have documents, right? As I was saying, there are leases, for example, you want to extract uh, data from these leases, such as square footage, uh, the price per square foot, the rent, and so on. Second is, you know, as I talked about maintenance, right? Things such as uh, cleaning or property management, if you will. And the third thing is investments where, you know, you think about lots of data coming together, both structured and unstructured, and you have both data at a macro level, as well as insights that you gather on a more local level, if you will. How do you think about AI in, in, in ways that, that are different than other kinds of technologies? You know, if you step back and you say, look, there's many things that you can do with structured data than necessarily... Um, you can build predictive insights and you can get predictive intelligence, if you will. But AI really comes in handy. And, and we need to step back and say, look, AI as a flavor has been around for a while, right? I mean, there's two aspects of AI, right? Um, this is my personal way of really thinking about it, which is that when we talk today about AI, we generally uh, talk about generative AI or we think about generative AI, which is about, you know, how do you develop content new content, such as text, images, or video, uh, by giving a variety of input. Now, previously, we've also had AI, which, again, my personal term, if you will, for it is analytical AI, right? Where you've had for a long time, you've had the structured data that financial companies or companies in retail or transportation have used, right? So for example, if you think in retail, personalization and commerce, right, is there, right? And, you know, there are companies look at, hey, how do I think about the placement on messaging? Generative AI uh, is about really looking at creation of that document or, or analyzing those documents. And again, when we look at it from a perspective of a commercial real estate firm, right, we look at, hey, what are the opportunities, if you will, to create value, to create that productive enhancement by looking at things such as lease documents, if you will. Uh, we in our own internal uh, uh, analysis, if you will, our internal work that we've done, for example, looking at manual review of lease documents, we've been able to use AI to cut that manual time by 25%, if you will, using AI to extract that data. Uh, and similarly, like there are other documents such as inspection reports, if you will. Um, and then there's the other opportunity around you know, smart, being smarter about facilities management, if you will, right? So again, it's, the, some of the foundational aspects will remain the same, Michael. It's again about contextualizing it, right? How do you bring that context, if you will, to the real estate workflows and the real estate operations? And which, by the way, is no different than taking AI and contextualizing it for any other industry. At the end of the day, you have to take a platform, if you will, uh, a large language model or a predictive capability and make sure you effectively contextualize it to your specific workflows in your specific industry, if you will. When you say contextualize it, can you elaborate on on what are the what you mean by that, and what are the pieces? How do you go about that? A lease document has a different kind of data points than, let's say, um, some other document will have, right? Um, and so. How do you understand through an LLM model that you want to be able to extract specific items such as the square footage, if you will, or you want to extract something like the price per square footage, or you want to extract the address, if you will, of the property that this lease is about, right? And there you have to make sure, quote unquote, call it the right prompt, uh, the right uh, entity that you are trying to extract. How do you contextualize that for real estate, right? And that's what I mean by is that there is a certain type of call it dictionary, there's a certain kind of call it entity, if you will, 
uh, that you are trying to recognize from that document, if you will, right? Um, and you have to be, you have to think about the right set of prompts. You have to think about the right set of uh, query, querying that document, if you will, to be able to extract information that is relevant to your operations as a real estate company. Is it mostly around efficiency, the improvements that you're looking for, or are there other use cases as well? It's not just purely about efficiency, right? It's, again, um, when we look at this, we look at it from a perspective of productivity enhancements are definitely one of this, right? And productivity enhancements means we have to look at the workflows that we have, right? So for example, Michael, 822nd episode of this podcast, right? Um, I'm I'm sure you have a certain workflow that you and I were talking about when before we went live, right? You have a clearly defined workflow. And as you look within that workflow, you know, what opportunities exist, if you will, to to optimize that workflow for your benefit, right? So similarly, we look at that from a productivity perspective, right? In previous lives, you know, I've had the uh, fortune of being in other industries such as tax and insurance and others, right? Um, and again, you look at the workflows from that productivity enhancement. I'll actually give you an interesting story. When I was in the music industry a while back uh, at a company called Snowcap, which was next Napster's second innings, if you will, right? Um, I found out that, you know, music companies would actually call the, the different stores like Tower Records if... Uh, not a lot of people may be aware that there was a company like that. But the, the analyst sitting at the music label would actually call uh, Tower Records all across the U.S. and call them and say, hey, how many, how many uh, volumes of this did you, how many CDs did you sell uh, of this album, if you will? Well, now you can get that data, right? With the digital distribution, that data is much easier to get. So what do you, you know, now you can focus on more, uh, value generating more higher level activities, if you will, insights that the data analyst can do. So that's definitely the productivity enhancements. The second thing is you look at the operating model, right? Within your existing business, uh, what operating models can you improve or can you transform business models, if you will, right? And that's where AI is really coming at it. Uh, slightly a different example, if you will, but in China, I was actually just reading up a few days ago, very interesting. Then in China, you have these e-commerce marketplaces that have a lot of influencers, right? Selling goods. And what they're doing now is you have these virtual avatars of these influencers that can get ready for about, you know, a thousand dollars or eleven hundred dollars. And they need just one minute of video. And these virtual avatars are up at 3 a.m. in the morning, 4 a.m. in the morning selling the goods. And if you pay a little bit more, they will actually read the live stream of comments and reply to them. Um, so very interesting, you know, in terms of how AI is introducing that opportunity for new operating models. And then the third piece is around how do you use AI? Uh, and we look at it to say, how do we use AI from a market, you know, leadership or bringing new thought leadership to the market? You know, things like sustainability or climate tech, if you will, which a lot of you know, our clients are interested in and are baking into their forward-looking plans. Please subscribe to the CXO Talk newsletter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Leave comments and check out CXOTalk.com. We have incredible shows coming up. You mentioned earlier the, uh, the issue of culture. Yeah. And we've been talking about data and the role that data plays and being able to drive these kind of changes. Where does culture fit into this? You need to think about what I call the digital AI roadmap. And then strategically, you need to think about your culture, if you will, right? And I think within culture, there's a couple of aspects that stand out. First and foremost is definitely, you know, what I was talking about earlier is how do you really think about the the strategic business alignment. You really bring this is you know AI isn't just a technology tool. You know if we're thinking of anybody who's thinking about AI purely as a technology answer, uh, isn't doing justice to the uh, isn't thinking about it the right way and is definitely not approaching it the right way um, because then they are probably doing tech for the sake of tech or in, you know innovation for the sake of innovation. If you have a if you think you have a hammer, then every everything looks like a nail, as they said, right? So that I think is the first and foremost thing is how do you really 
think about AI as an opportunity to solve something differently, right? You previously could not solve it because you didn't have the right, uh, without AI, you didn't have the right infrastructure or the complexity was so large, right, that you couldn't solve it. Um, so that's one is how do you think about contextualizing it again within that business, within your strategic alignment? That's one. I think the second is creating a culture around experimentation. Um, like with any new technology, right, if you will, and I mean this in the in the context of generative AI, if you will, right, um, not everything will be a slam dunk, right? So what you have to do is create a culture of experimentation about learning fast and most importantly, moving at pace and urgency so you can operationalize even faster, right? So that's the second pillar, if you will. The third pillar in my mind is what I call responsible innovation. Right? With AI, the one thing you have to be uh, mindful about, careful about, is the uh, potential for hallucinations, right? Um, if you ask AI the wrong question, if you will, that is not properly contextualized, uh, then you're going to potentially get some wrong answers in there, which means that this is not a silver bullet to everything, right? You have to think about validation. You have to think about, um, you have to think about, you know, uh, validation of process with some human in the loop, if you will, right? So that's what I mean by cultures, right? You have to step back and say, how do I really get started, if you will? How do I really operationalize AI? So you're thinking very explicitly then, correct me if I'm wrong, about your processes and changing your processes to reflect the realities of AI, like you said, like with large language models, the potential for hallucinations. It's not about doing AI for the sake of AI, but we're actively saying, look, as we look at these workflows, if you will, right, what are the possibilities for those AI interventions in these workflows, right? Um, and we, you know, if you look at workflow all the way from you're identifying an asset, if you will, right, you're some kind of brokerage where there's some leasing discussion going on, you're trying to figure out, hey, I have certain parameters and for which, you know, that are related to this asset that I'm interested in a prop, you know, office, industry, or whatever, right, uh, retail, and so on, right? And within that, there is a certain amount of workflow, right, in terms of identification of that asset. Then you have, okay, I've identified that asset. What do I think about the financing of that asset? Or if you are a seller, how do I think about the sale of that asset, right? Um, if you are acquiring an asset, then, you know, there's an aspect of managing that asset, right? Both managing as in physically managing the asset, but managing the investment that you've made into the asset, right? And that's what I was talking about earlier. If you recall the three things that I said was, okay, you know, asset identification, um, and there's documents around it. And as you think about those documents, you know, what do you think about the, how do you think about the workflows where you can create some uh, efficiencies or productivity enhancements, if you will, uh, as you think about property management, you know, how do you think about, you know, enhancements there? Um, and then as you think about it as an investment, what are the opportunities? Uh, let me uh, take an example, if you will, right? So again, going back to our smart facility management solution, right, which I talked about has about, we have about 1 billion square foot. Um, using the building and operations data, right, this is part of that contextualizing, if you will, the workflow building, the uh, using the building operations data. Uh, we looked at actions such as automate, automated maintenance, right? And so that meant that we could actually reduce the tech dispatch, if you will, by about 25%. Um, and the operating expenses that were there with this automated maintenance, we were able to reduce the energy and the maintenance by as much as 20%. So again, we look back and say, let's look at all these workflows, if you will, and look at opportunities where you can bring AI into the mix um, and that can actually create value for uh, for the organization and create value for our clients and, and deliver much better differentiated outcomes for our clients. So on that point, we have uh, an interesting question from Elizabeth Shaw on Twitter, who asks, can you provide some examples of how AI has changed the way real estate services, the real estate services and investment business works? as you look at some of these interventions, right? Because, I mean, it's a great question, um, but again, it spans across multiple, you know, aspects, if you will. So if I go back to what I said, right, is 
you look at things such as documents, right? And so, for example, we have today internally created automated content creation capabilities, right? That take us, that used to take two weeks, but now take two hours, right? You know, I talked about, you know, again, earlier about um, taking this uh, smart facilities and, you know, saving operating expenses such as energy and maintenance by as much as, you know, uh, 20%, if you will. But again, similarly, we had for a healthcare client where we utilized dynamic cleaning and we saved uh, uh, 11% savings over the baseline that we have. So again, it's the opportunity to really look at that data, uh, look at that workflow and say, where exactly do you bring AI into the middle here into as an intervention, as an opportunity, if you will, uh, to really create some workflow productivity enhancements and, and, uh, and some savings, if you will. Can you drill in a little into the, the mechanism? What is it about these tools or the technology or the, or the way you're using the data that, for example, enabled you to go from, what did you say, two months to two weeks or something like that? I don't remember the exact, the exact numbers you said. It's about two weeks to two hours, right? So uh, in a sense, what you are doing is you're looking at the workflow and you're looking at the existing set of documents and you're looking in an instance, some form of pattern, if you will, to say, look, the more uh, I can learn about this and, and to a certain extent, extent, Michael, it's also about the scale, right? How do you really think about it, right? So when you have a scale, then you can identify certain patterns and those patterns start giving you insights into you know, what is that workflow, repeatable workflow that is happening here and how you can how you can create that workflow or operationalize or optimize that workflow, if you will, right? And it, in essence, uh, you, you have to have three things from a, a foundational perspective that you have to bring into the picture here. One is the data capability. So, you know, AI doesn't happen overnight, right? Uh, at CBRE, our focus on data and having enterprise-grade technology has been there for a long time, right? And which has allowed us to move quickly, you know, if you will, uh, into AI, especially generative AI, right? So that data capabilities, having an enterprise data platform where we can transform data at scale, understand data at scale, get insights from this data at scale, has been a key pillar of our uh, uh, foundation, if you will, right? Tech foundation. The second thing is really um, looking at is setting up a generative AI platform and you know, not necessarily trying to solve for one use case, if you will, but understanding, if you will, patterns. I mean, we've launched industry's first large language model, uh, if you will, multi-language model interface, right? And we've got, we, we focus on rather than um, focusing on, on one specific use case, we made it self-service internally so that people could utilize it it has many of the same features as ChatGPT. And we made it in such a way that people you could utilize it for many different use cases, if you will, right? And then the third piece is, you know, how do you really go back and look at utilizing the information, the insights that you got from those data, data capabilities to say, in this workflow, what is the end result that needs to be there, right? And what does that end result really mean for the customer that is utilizing that end result. So I think across those three things, the data capabilities, some form of analytical AI to really think about the usage, and then the Gen AI platform, if you will, you start looking at that pattern recognition, you start looking at that workflow, and it's not a one size fits all and you know, situations are different, but you know, once you have a certain approach to it, certain pattern to it, it starts giving you that value, if you will. We have a really interesting question from Arsalan Khan on Twitter, and Arsalan is a regular listener, and he always asks very, uh, very thought-provoking questions. You're working with such a large body of data. How do you ensure that you have confidence in the data? Because you're ultimately going to be making potentially very large decisions on the basis of that data? We have you know, a lot of uh, internal data that we would triangulate with, with. We have data partnerships, if you will, right? Um, and those data partnerships, what data we have, uh, what data can we use? And, and the third party 
data, if you will, data through, that we gather through data partnerships allows us the ability to be able to triangulate some of that data and understand the, um, call it the integrity of the data, right? And, and if you go back, back, if you will, right, where I said was, look, as in when you set up AI as a culture, not every use case will be successful in the beginning, right? And in some cases, we've actually had to, we've learned fast that there's certain type of data, if you will, that either isn't collect, being collected at the level of granularity that is required for this use case, or isn't being collected at the level of comprehensiveness, if you will, in, in this. And then we've stepped back and said, okay, what are the op- you know, what are the proxies, if you will, for that kind of data set that we can use? Instead of you know, the scope that we were originally thinking about, could we think about it at a smaller scope, if you will, right? And so that's where we've stepped back and said, most important our focus has been, you know, our focus previously and continues to be around as one key aspect of our data platform, right? This is, again, I stress back on the enterprise data platform that we have, is we have to step back and say, can we enable this UI use case through the data that we have access to? Are there opportunities for proxies? Are there opportunities that we need to fundamentally think about the workflow, not just in terms of the workflow, the existing workflow, but do we need to change the workflow that we have in order to be able to collect this data going forward? Or are there proxies, if you will, um, that can give us an opportunity to make some advancement in the use case that we have? So, but a, a great question, you know, if, um, that's that's a very key, I would say, path forward and focus, if you will, that we have in terms of how do we really think about our data, both what we have, uh, what we can use, and that which we can source, if you will, through our partnerships. So the partnerships aspect is also another very important foundation of your ability to execute on this kind of AI data-driven strategy? Absolutely. Absolutely, Michael. I mean, we we don't believe that, you know, we just have to go it alone, right? It's it's We have a very strong um, build, buy, or partner strategy, right? I mean, we don't believe that, again, we have to do it all, right? It, at the end of the day, it's about the time to value and the client outcomes that we really focus on, right? And to that extent, you know, again, going back to that strategic alignment that I talked about, is we look at those strategic CBRE priorities and we say, in order to achieve these, in order to get to these CB, you know, strategic priorities, uh, what do we have as capability today? And who are the potential partners that we need to have in the marketplace, right? And we scan the market on a regular basis for partners as well as emerging, com- uh, emerging companies, if you will. Um, Alison Bell, who I work very closely with, you know, is a global head of our digital strategy, tech acceleration and partnerships. And Alison and her team, you know, regularly look at the market from, you know, from our digital strategy perspective for what we need in terms of partnerships. And today I will say that, you know, we have partnerships with all the major tech providers, if you will. Um, and it has given us uh, an edge, if you will, in terms of early access to capabilities such as large language models or other Gen AI capabilities that we have integrated into our ecosystem of the uh, digital and technology stack that we have. Um, I think we, we've also made, um, to share, we've also made you know uh, selective investments, if you will, right? So we made a $100 million investment in, in VTS, who are in the leasing and property management space, as well as, you know, uh, partnership with DeepKey, if you will. DeepKey is a company that, you know, collects uh, energy, waste, and water data. You know, so if you think from a sustainability perspective, that's very important. So again, to bring it back to your point again, it wasn't, it, it isn't about, you know, building everything internally, if you will. It's about the time to value to the market. The DNA of CBRE, of course, is about commercial real estate and you're describing ways of working and ways of thinking about this data this data asset that Mm -hmm. is is very different from the skill set and the background and the culture of commercial real estate so how do you make that kind of 
transition where the folks in the company can learn to think this way and learn to think about data as being an asset? Yes, it's relatively new technology, but if you think about other previous technologies, right? I mean, um, digital transformation, right? About utilizing data at scale, if you will, right? Or about uh, being able to um, capture other data, you know, large scale data at scale, right? I mean, um, at CBRE, you know, uh, we're all about physical assets and physical assets have a lot of data associated with them, right? Uh, the location, you know, uh, location being the address, if you will, or the floor or within the floor of what exactly, you know, if you have more than one, you know, company on a given floor, you know, what exactly is part of one versus the other. So, uh, or previously even IOT, right? So I think it's, uh, it ultimately goes back, if you will, to say, hey, what exactly are those strategic priorities? And talking about, you know, how you think about uh, AI as a potential solution, right? So again, we, we need to step back and, uh, and this is something that we have focused very much on is stepping back and really defining the problem statement, right? Um, and so once we define that problem statement, that's when we bring AI into the mix and say, is AI the right solution here? Is, uh, is a different technology the right solution here, right? We, we don't have to, in essence, bring AI to bear on each and every question, if you will, right? In some cases, for example, right? I mean, if, if we're trying to build a simple dashboard that gives people, you know, uh, certain metrics, right? Simple, quick metrics, right? At the first, you know, you just want to be able to quickly build a dashboard. And then you say, okay, how do I make it better, right? How do I make interaction with this dashboard better? That's where you utilize a chatbot-like capability to be able to, you know, query the data in the dashboard. Again, it's, you know, I would say there's a bit of a, maybe a, a bit of a misunderstanding out there that, you know, commercial real estate, um, you know, isn't as far advanced, if you will. Um, I think it's all about, you know, our applicability, if you will, of digital transformation or AI if you will, to the solution. Um, the the one other thing you kind of touch based on, and it's a slightly bit of a digression, is, um, you know, we, we there is this aspect that every company needs to be a tech company. And I have a bit of a <laughs> fundamental, uh, uh, call it a personal disagreement with that, right? Which is to say, not everything needs to be called a tech company, right? Not every company needs to be called a tech company, right? It's about, how do you really utilize tech in order to um, operate within the workflows, in order to operate within the industry that you are working on, right? Uh, we are a commercial real estate company. We bring technology to bear. We bring AI to bear to really help our clients achieve certain outcomes for us to achieve certain strategic business priorities, right? And that's one of the many tools that we have at our disposal to be able to achieve uh, the outcomes that we need to achieve. I think you're being very clear that the fundamental strategic goals of the company have not changed because AI has been introduced into the mix. And so everything you're doing with these tools continue to support the ongoing strategic goals of the enterprise. Exactly. Of our customers, at the end of the day, it's about, you know, I know I've said strategic business alignment, others, but in part of that, I said client outcomes. At the end of the day, it's about how do we serve our customers better, that customer centricity, right? And, um, and if you do a great job at being customer centric, if you do a great job at really focusing on solving the problems that your customers are really facing, thinking about, or need to plan for, and I think you set yourselves up in the right uh, for, for being successful. Arsalan Khan comes back and says, how do you know or figure out that the recommendations made by the AI based on the data are correct or not? And he's asking if you have any kind of a governance process in place for this, especially given the fact that the, that you're working with so many different par partners and you're sourcing data from different different uh, organizations. One is about data, and the other is about um, 
validation of the outcomes, right, of the recommendations, right? So one is about data and the other is about, you know, the model that you have pointed to that data, you know, is that model really giving you the answers or is serving you appropriately, right, in terms of the answers, right? Um, I think from a data perspective, as I said, right, we have the benefit of having a large treasure trove of data, if you will, of, you know, 39 billion data points. So where we are, you know, as the largest commercial real estate company in a bit of a unique situation, if you will, to to triangulate, to validate some of that data and be able to um, utilize uh, both internal data that we can use as well as the external data partnerships. So there's that validation, if you will, from that perspective. I think the second part is about model and models are iterative, right? So you look at and say, look, the model recommendation that I got, right? You, um, you iteratively build a model, if you will, from a small scale to operating at a larger scale. And this is what I was saying earlier, right? It's easy to operate at a small scale, but it's complex and to operate at a large scale. And so from that model perspective, you really, really look at iterative uh, approach, if you will. So you say, look, you know, let me apply this particular model in one particular building, if you will, with one particular client, if you will, um, and see what results do I start to get, right? Because inevitably, what you will find is, and this, by the way, is not specific to commercial real estate. This is very broadly what you do is when you're building a model, you will find that there are certain aspects, certain factors that you did not take into account or you did not know to take into account. And that comes when you're trying to operationalize the model, right? Because it's one thing to build a model. And then it's another thing to actually put the model in practice and operationalize it. And so from that perspective, we, you know, we have constant feedback loops, constant validation loops. And this is where I was saying earlier also, especially in the context of generative AI, you have to be careful and you have to have that validation and you have to have that human in the loop, if you will, to make sure that you know, you're not getting in some form of hallucination. I, I know I'm digressing a little bit from a model, if you will, to, to generative AI, if you will, right? But again, this is about creating the right feedback loop, making sure you understand the right business problem that you were trying to solve with the model, making sure that you have the right data points in order to assess uh, the right business problems, um, uh, to assess that the model is actually performed. Um, uh, I'll give you uh, an example, which I can't talk much in detail about, but uh, at a high level, you know, uh, we're, we were working on, we've been working on this particular model, if you will, um, for one of our businesses. And the, the question, one of the feedback that we recently got was, uh, yeah, you know, we can look at documents from this resolution or this perspective, what if you change the document orientation? What happens? And again, this is exactly where orient in the, that operationalizing the model really comes into place, right? Um, so hopefully, I've asked Arsenal. I've answered Arsenal's question. You know, I think Arsenal, you should definitely connect with me on LinkedIn because I'd love to learn more. And I, I think anybody who has a great thought process, a very clear, structured thought process, um, I'd love to connect with them. We have another question from Twitter, and this is, you've been talking about the relationship between the company's business strategy and your AI investment strategy, but how do they influence each other, your business strategy and the AI investment strategy? How, how do they work together? You're not out there to say, today I'm going to have an AI use case. <laughs> Right. I mean, because if you go out there and say, I have an AI use case, then you're simply going to look for a place where you can go invest it. Right. But you need to step back and say, well, what is the business strategy? And where can I go solve that business strategy better, faster, at a larger scale? How can I create that impact, you know, for faster time to value? How can I be more cost effective, right? Drive higher productivity. Or can I bring new solutions, if you will, to bear because they were previously very complex, if you will, right? And so, and from that perspective, you say, in order to really achieve that business strategy, these are the set of 
tech investments. And as part of the tech investments, these are the set of AI investments I need to make to be able to achieve those three things in faster time to value, ability to have, uh, deal with larger scale and be able to solve more complex problems. You know, there's this blog post that, that this reminds me about. Um, Bill Gates has this Gates notes that I subscribe to and they land in my email, you know, every, uh, whenever he publishes them. Um, one blog post from about a year ago uh, that he wrote and he said, he called it the age of AI has begun. Very interesting. It's a it's a very comprehensive one. I would suggest people to look, you know, find it. The age of AI has begun and read it. Um, is this, you know, he talks about, among other things, he talks about the fact that, you know, the use of AI is especially relevant in systems that have scale and complexity that it's tough and hard for humans to really deal with, right? Um, and he talks about the example of uh, he talked about the example of drug discovery, right? Or healthcare, right? In which you have complex biological systems, right? That are very tough for us as humans to be able to, uh, to be able to uh, track and comprehend at that level, right? So I think, again, I, I go back to the scale and complexity net, uh, and in that context. Second thing is personalization is what he talked about, right? Especially within the context of the societal good about education, right? How do we really tailor content? How do we, um, how do we track, you know, how much engagement a student has with a certain content and how do we track it so we can tailor content for better educational outcomes, if you will? How do you think about the ROI of your investments in AI? Is, th is there anything, are, are there any distinctions how you evaluate AI ROI relative to other investments that the company might make? There's one aspect, culture of experimentation, right? Learning fast. Um, sometimes, you know, that precision that you've had, that you can have with certain business cases to be able to say, look, if I were to go down this path, this would be precisely the impact I could make. And this would be precisely the outcome that I could get. And therefore, precisely the return I could get, right? Um, as with any new technology, and you know, with AI, uh, you may not be able to get that level of precise answers about what the impact of that you know, scope will be. And so, fundamentally, no, there is no difference, right? When you think about it, the fundamentals, and what I mean by the fundamentals, what you are tracking to make sure that you look at the ROI, which is things like, you know, productivity or, you know, top line growth or things like free cash flow that can be generated or client outcomes like better client experience, if you will. Fundamentally, those metrics don't should not change, right? And we don't think about it, you know, them as being different. But the aspect is, that if you look at 100 AI use cases, you may be able to bring that precision to a certain number of them. And in other cases, you just have to go forward and say, look, you know, this is about experimentation. This is about learning fast. And this is, you know, if we don't go through this door, we're not going to be able to understand what lies on the other side. And so hopefully that answers your question, Michael. It, it's, yes, fundamentally the same. But keeping in mind that when faced with a new technology, you have to make um, you have to take certain, uh, you may not have the most precise answer in part of the use case, if you will. So part of that is the cultural change responding to the nature of the technology. Exactly, exactly. My advice for anybody would be to say, look, you know, as you look at the opportunity for AI to drive impact, especially transforming, you know, the way in which we work or in terms of helping us gather insights, driving predictions. Uh, we just have to step back and say, look, we need to, we need to have a culture of learning fast. We need to have the culture of moving at pace and urgency. Uh, and, and sometimes that may mean that you seed uh, a separate investment for these kind of things so that you can do that. And equally importantly, something that we've done as CBRE for a long time, um, is, you know, making sure that you invest in the right data in enterprise grade technology stack. And then finally, um, is making sure that you continue to contextualize 
your problems and your solutions. Um, or you contextualize your solutions to the use cases to the industry that you are in and the workflows that you have. Being clear about the the outcomes, the processes, and and the workflows, as you said. Exactly, exactly. And you know what? It, it sounds easy, but it's not, right? Um, because sometimes, you know, there's this, hey, let's go sh- chase the shiny object, if you will. And that's what I'm saying is, let's not chase the shiny object. Let's figure out where that application is and, and what's the value of that application. Let's continue to move forward, but be mindful, be pragmatic, be strategic about it. Actually, it does not sound so easy to me because (laughs) you have an existing set of clients, existing set of processes and revenue drivers, and the company works in a particular way. And now you're talking about introducing a potentially significant change, which is disruptive, but at the same time, you don't want to disrupt what works. Yes, and that goes back again to what I was saying about operationalizing, right? AI, right? You you have to think about in the context of how do you really um, bring the the technology, you bring AI, if you will, to bear in that operational context, and what are some of the aspects you need to be mindful about, you know, when you try to operationalize it. So it is. This is again why it goes back into looking at what are your strategic business priorities and what are the workflows, if you will. Right, that you have, right? I mean, uh, you know, in my prior lives, I've served as a chief product officer, and I, I, uh, I often talked about that. You know, I want to take the word product management and change it to workflow management, because at the end of the day, you're building products for a certain workflow, right? You're trying to solve for a certain improving certain workflow. So, should we call it workflow management with digital technology and or with digital and and technical uh, digital applications and write the best technical technology enterprise grade technology stack? Yeah, maybe part of that is that, right? We have one final question from Twitter again from Arsalan Khan, who again asks a very thought provoking question, and it looks like he's going to have the final word here or the final question. <laughs> what happens when an executive uses their vote to not do anything with AI inside the organization? How can non-executives change that veto? You have to step back and first and foremost understand why they did that, right? Because if you're trying to solve simply as a knee-jerk reaction and say, oh, look, you know, somebody said such and such thing and and therefore uh I need to have an immediate reaction because, you know, my my belief is that the problem requires a different solution. Then you're going to find yourselves in a tough spot. I think the first and foremost question, the first and foremost approach is to understand why that veto happened in the first place. You know, there might be some legitimate reasons, right? You know, um, again, as I, you know, I always coach and advise, you know, people is to say, first and foremost, understand the industry, understand the workflows, get into the details of the workflows, if you will, right? And so is it the fact of, hey, uh, that veto happened because, you know, the solution that is being designed is is gonna, is going to be great, but it doesn't have the right level of operational considerations to it for deployment, right? And if that's the case, then you go solve that problem. If the problem is, hey, yeah, the solution is great, but it only solves part of my problem. And in order to, you know, you're asking me to fundamentally change 100% of my workflow while you're only going to bring a solution that only solves 10% or 20%. And I'm not going to go disrupt uh, people who, you know, are used to a certain workflow only to be disrupted for 10 to 20% of the workflow. Then that's a, then you have to go answer that question differently. So I'd say the first and foremost thing is the art of asking questions, right? Step back, ask the question, understand the, dis- the, the, the reason behind the veto, right? If you will, uh, because nobody ever said um, that, you know, hey, I, I don't wanna do things, um, I, I don't wanna grow my revenue, or I don't wanna have a higher margin, or I don't wanna have higher free cash flow. There's nobody out there who says that, right? So there must be a reason behind it. And I think it's imperative, first and foremost, to understand that reason. A lot of wise advice right there. 
And with that, I want to say a huge thank you to Satnam Singh from CBRE. Satnam, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me, Michael. It has been a pleasure. Everybody watching, thank you for being such a great audience and to the people asking these excellent questions. Thank you so much. Before you go, please subscribe to the CXO Talk newsletter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Leave comments and check out CXOTalk.com. We have incredible shows coming up. Thank you so much, everybody. I hope you have a great day and we will see you again next time. <laughs>